Hi, and welcome back to another video. In this video, we're gonna look at tying together some of the concepts that we've seen before. So we looked at spawning small modular 3D buildings, using Perlin noise to generate kind of height map effects, in this case, to set the heights of all the different buildings. And in this video, we're gonna look at spawning buildings in city blocks, tying in some of those earlier concepts, and also a few kind of just general tips for procedural generation quality of life. Let's check it out. All right, so over the last few videos, we've been exploring this imaginary city's scene with some random building generation, some Perlin noise, right? And in this video, I just wanna show you how it all comes together. So if you saw, the final example, basically what we have is we can push space to generate this kind of height map of buildings with some, some streets. We can also fly around. And so then we can also scale our Perlin noise to modify the height map, get some more noisy scaled out results, right? Create different types of cities based on sampling the height from this Perlin noise texture. So in a separate video, we looked at kind of how the Perlin noise itself is generated. We also looked at how the individual building columns are generated. And now I wanna show you how it all comes together in the final result. What we've got is basically we have this generator object, which is this generated object control script attached to it. Basically, this is really simple, but it's a nice quality of life thing. I'll go through it quickly. Basically, again, I made this a static instance so we can access it from anywhere, but it's mainly holding a list of all the objects that are generated during the generation process. It's got a reference to the Perlin generator and a reference to the grid spawner that spawns the grid of kind of city blocks. In Awake, right, we make sure that it's a singleton. If it's not, we destroy it. I know people have different opinions about singletons, but in this case, it's helping me, so. Don't complain. So then basically we just have this add object method. What it takes in a game object and we can call it from anywhere because this is static. We just add things to our generated objects list as we generate them. All the different scripts that generate things just pass them into this list and then we can easily basically have a list of everything in the scene and get rid of it at will. In update, we're looking for input. In this case, I'm using jump, right, spacebar. And then we're just gonna clear all objects and generate. Now, why am I doing this? This is really useful if you wanna quickly iterate on your procedural content. Having to enter and exit play mode is relatively slow and compared to being able to just hit spacebar to regenerate. And so being able to, to work this way allows you to work really quickly and iterate on your generation without having to constantly go in and out of play mode. We also have this, I put in, Input dot get key down key code R just to really reload the scene and delete everything, which I was using for another one of these videos, but this basically just reloads the scene. It's a little bit slower, I think, than clearing and generating, but anyway, that's another option. In the generate function, we just call the generate method of our Perlin generator and the generate method of our grid spawner, right? And we just have public references to those. Probably would be better in a bigger project to do this with like an event, but it's a small project, so I just have hard-coded references. And then we have our clear all objects method here, which just basically loops over our list of generated objects. In fact, it's actually setting them to inactive, which is a little bit faster than turning them off. I think if you were doing this for hours and hours, you might run into some issues, but most of the time it's fine to just deactivate things instead of destroying them. And then they'll be destroyed when you exit play mode or when you reset the scene, right? So that's a little tip just in terms of making things faster. Another little tip here is for generating, you may notice that because we're looping over this and removing things, we need to do it backwards. A little visual studio tip here is if you do four R and then push tab, it'll insert a reverse for loop for you. I used to have to Google that every time until I figured that out. I forgot I was watching some video and somebody pointed that out. So shout out to them. I think it was, what's his name? Code Dinosaur. Anyway, shout out to you. Actually, his videos are good. So check him out. That's basically it, right? This is really just a simple little quality of life thing, but it's pretty nice to have. Then we have this building generator noise input. Now this is a little bit different from the simple building generator that I showed in the earlier video, right? This is kind of a standalone simplified version. This version really just adds this line and integrates it, 
which is that it takes a sampled value that it's sampling the stepped position from our Perlin noise texture, which is generated by our Perlin generator, right? And that we went over in detail in another video, but basically it's just generating a Perlin noise texture that we can sample pseudo random values from. So we're sampling that in, we're passing in the transform position because we are basically converting from a world spaced coordinate to a, an approximate position in the Perlin texture and then sampling that stepped, right? So we're sampling at every four or five pixels in a kind of a grid. We're then using that to set the target number of pieces we want our building to spawn, right? So we're saying max pieces times sampled value, and then we're flooring that to an int, right? Because it needs to be an int. And then we're saying target pieces will add a random bit of variation on the minimum and variation on the maximum. This is actually set to zero in the demo, but it's nice if you want to get some extra noise within the more smooth, low scale values. So that's a little tip, but it's not actually active right now. If target pieces ends up being less than or equal to zero, we'll just return, right? We won't spawn anything, which is nice because sometimes when we have low values, that'll make holes in the city, which is kind of cool. Then we have a height offset, right? And this is going back to our simple building generator. I won't go through this whole script in detail because I covered that in the other video, but basically, we're now generating a number of target pieces, stacking them on top of each other with the height offset using this spawn piece layer function. And you can check out that video on how that works. I'll link it in the description and it'll be in the playlist as well. So basically we have our generated object control, which is calling our noise texture generation. And then our buildings are sampling from the noise texture. The only other piece of this, and I think this is a relatively important piece of this is that we're generating these streets in between our blocks, right? And this actually is uh, a big part of what makes it look like a city and not just like a weird noisy landscape, right? And the way that that's done is with this block grid, right? We're going back to our good old spawning a grid technique. Basically what we're doing is spawning a four by four, right? Four kind of city blocks along the X and four city blocks along the Z. What we're spawning is a building cluster, which is another grid spawner that we'll look at in a second. We have our origin. The offset gives us, this is four by four, right? And then the offset is what produces the gaps. So if we say, okay, we're going to spawn four by four and then move 10, this is what leaves the gaps between the things. So if we set this to eight, I believe, yeah, then we just end up with like a big kind of layer cake of buildings, which is also cool, right? But now it doesn't look as much like a city, right? We could also go to like 12. We want bigger gaps or streets between buildings, but uh, I felt like 10 given the unit size was like the right kind of two spaces between each building. And I felt like that looked more or less right. So good old spawning a grid comes to the rescue again. And then basically the building clusters are just another grid spawner, in this case, eight by eight. Let's go back to our block grid. Let's just spawn one by one. Again, right, you see how my uh, being able to stay in play mode and do this is helping me. And then basically the building cluster is just eight by eight, right? If we respawn it as four by four, it just gives us this smaller building, right? So we could also maybe randomize this, but this is basically what's giving us the city layout, right? And so it's pretty important. And in this case, the grid offset is one, which is the size of each of these things is one uh, unity unit wide and long. So that's basically it, right? We're using two nested grid spawners, sampling our noise texture to generate the height, and it's all coming together to create something which I feel is pretty cool, right? Again, this is not very highly optimized, AKA not optimized at all. We could do some mesh combining like we saw in another video on the channel to gain some optimization here. I think also if we did some smarter stuff, this is just the insides of the buildings are full of little pieces that don't need to be there, right? So we could do some detection of, am I surrounded by neighbors? Then I could deactivate myself, right? And get back some performance that way. There's a lot we could do to get back performance, but I didn't want to kind of pre-optimize this. I figured let's just generate the thing. And then if we like it, we can, we can get into some optimization. But hopefully you found that interesting. 
and thanks so much for watching. So thanks a lot for checking out this little kind of mini series on procedural city generation. I probably will come back to this topic in the future because it's one I just really can't get enough of. But if you guys have ideas for future videos or areas that you'd love to see me dig into more deeply, I'd love to hear it in the comments down below. Don't forget to like the video if you enjoyed it. Of course, you can give it a dislike, double click that dislike if you, uh, if you didn't enjoy it. Make sure that you're subscribed if you're enjoying the content so that you can get notified when new videos come out. As always, I really appreciate your spending time with me and thanks so much for watching.